G'day folks, Pat Callanan here. Over the years, we've traveled together to many different Australian towns, but I've never actually taken you here. Now this place, it is particularly significant for this bloke because this is where I grew up. In fact, my old man was a school principal right here at Brewarrina Central School. Yep, that's me in the middle row, looking very determined in my freshly ironed school uniform. I cannot believe that this place is still here. My mum used to walk me down here and pick up some fresh meat for the evening meal while I would pick up some mixed lollies. But Brewarrina, it's not just special for me, it's actually special for our entire nation. Brewarrina sits on the Barwon River, a headwater of the Darling River, which winds through the western heartland of New South Wales. And with it, a million memories are woven into the rich and beautiful history of our nation. It is the starting point of what many regard as the archetypal four-wheel drive journey through our culture, the Darling River Run. Travelling with me on this adventure is my friend and colleague, Wes Whitworth. Together, in our Amarox, we'll travel to some of Australia's most iconic outback sites, as well as a few I never expected to see. And because it's that time of year, we're finishing this jaunt with a massive knees up at the world's most remote music festival, the Big Red Bash. The Darling River Run takes us from Rewarana through Burke, down to Louth, then Tilpa, and on to Menindee, where we turn our wheels north for Birdsville's biggest week of the year. This little town of just over a thousand people is home to one of the world's oldest and most incredible man-made structures, the Rewarrina Fish Traps. You're looking at the oldest man-made structure in the world. We know that, right? But for us, this is our home, right? First and foremost, so um, this is what we belong to. David Kirby is a proud elder of the Ngemba mob, custodians of the fish traps and other sacred sites in the region. This is from years and years of grinding, right? Whether it be sitting here, you see fires, grinding stones, spears, tools and stuff like that. For thousands of years, at special times and during drought, different tribes from as far away as 500 kilometres would come in for corroborees, initiations and to share food and water. So you'd have the Murawari people, Barambinya people, Barkindji, Nyampawanga, Nyampawa, all these people would come here to use these traps. If Pat was coming in a thousand years ago, Pat, that's your fish trap over there, you look after that. Whatever fish you catch is yours to feed your tribe, right? For a long period of time, people don't talk about it, but the importance of it is 20, 30, 40,000 years, these people had social and economic structures so advanced that I think we still live by them same principles today, you know? The ancient history here is fascinating, but so is the very unique fishing technique practiced by the locals. I don't know if you know this, but this is our little secret. Right, you feel the fish, rub the belly, right, stops them. The belly stops and paralyzes them, right? So the yellow belly stop, push them against the rock, slide your fingers up into their gills and you bring them up. Right? Keep that secret to yourself, Pat. I will, mate, I will. <laughs> Many travellers drive through this part of the country on their way to somewhere else. But my advice is to slow down, explore the dirt roads, and always keep your eyes and hearts open because you never know what you're going to bump into next. What have we here? A little gyrocopter. <laughs> the things you see out the back of Bree. Yeah, mate. Hi, I'm Pat. Yeah, Pat, Ben. Good to meet you, Ben. That's a cool little machine you got there, mate. Yeah. Ben is a sheep farmer and he uses the gyrocopter to round up scattered flocks on his massive property. So how many cc are, are, uh, is powering this? Oh, yeah, about 100 cc. About 100 each. Yeah, OK. <laughs> They're a simple machine, aren't they, mate? Yeah, not much, <laughs> not much to it. Do you work on it yourself? Or? Yeah, yeah, i got a couple of these, so this is one. This is sort of my second one I bought it off a neighbour. Probably better get back now, I guess. Might get the head chopped off here. <laughs> mm, 
I want one. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> Down the road, we come across the mobile sheep yards. It's crutching and drenching season. The shearers clear dags and wool from around the sheep's crutch to make it easier and cleaner for breeding. Check out this guy, Brownie. He's 75 years old and has been shearing for 58 years. I just love it. <laughs> Mate, with young people all the time, with people all the time around, you're not lonely. Or... <laughs> you keep with the young people. Naturally, crack. I have to jump in and have a go. <laughs> this could get messy. You need a bit more practice on that. I do, mate, I do. <laughs> and believe me, this is seriously hard yakka. I'd be very happy if I'm half as fit as Brownie at 75. OK. The road between Burke and Brewarana is flat and straight, but if you chuck a left up the Tarcoon Road, you'll find a sweet little spot. It is called Mount Oxley. Here we go, open sesame. Now, Mount Oxley is on private property, but it's pretty easy to get permission. Just go to the back of Burke Centre, pay a few bucks, and you will get to camp right up that hill behind me. As you can see, this is a Mesa-like formation. Mesa basically meaning flat top or table in Spanish. And here we go, readying for our climb to the top. Straight away, you get a magnificent view of the surrounding area. This is pretty cool, folks. This is something that you want to do yourself. The view up here is breathtaking. The campsite and facilities, an extremely pleasant surprise. Look at that. The best sunset view within 100 miles, guaranteed. When we finish the Darling River run, we're going to Birdsville for the Big Red Bash. This year, the bash organisers are attempting to break the Guinness Book of World Records for the most people doing the Nutbush Disco Dance. Unfortunately, I don't know the steps, mate. I, do you know the steps? I may recall from my youth, and I mean a long, long time ago. Your misspent youth. I think... <laughs> right, come on, on your feet. On your feet, I'm not doing this solo. As far as I recall, left foot out. Mm -hmm. And this is where Australian Adventure TV enters that twilight zone between comedy and tragedy. Out, cross, that one. And then, okay, do it all again. Uh, it'll be fine. I'm gonna have to study every night with you, Wes. I can feel this. <laughs> Before continuing our journey down the Darling River Run, I want to show you something very strange right next to our campsite. All through the top of Mount Oxley, you've got these amazing little mini craters, but I've done some research on the phone and nobody knows exactly what caused these things. I mean, there's all sorts of theories. We've got gaseous explosions on here. We've got uh, evil spirits, omens, even artillery fire on here that might have caused this. Which just goes to prove you can't trust Wikipedia. I contacted Ngemba man Phil Sullivan who explained back in the day his people used this mesa to quarry grinding discs that were then traded and used to grind flour and sharpen spears. When you're driving on these outback dirt roads, they are absolutely gorgeous, but if you get it wrong, they could come back to bite you. So here are my tips for driving on the dirt. Firstly, where the rubber hits the road is always the most important part of a four-wheel drive because that's where all your traction and all your braking comes from. And you're gonna get better braking by choosing all-terrain or mud-terrain tires. Not only that, you'll also get better longevity out of those tires as well. Now, you don't run road tire pressures out in these parts. If you're used to running 40 to 45 PSI on the road, on the bitumen, 
drop that down to closer to 32 to 28 psi. Then you're going to get a smoother ride and far better traction and longer life out of your rubber. Our next stop is Burke. In the 1890s, Henry Lawson wrote, if you know Burke, then you know Australia. Well, times have changed a lot since Henry wrote those words. Back then, it was a thriving centre of Australia's lucrative wool trade. Sprawling outback stations generated fortunes on the sheep's and shearers' backs. And this town was where it all came to be loaded and shipped down the Darling and on to the mother country, England. It was here that so much of our outback culture was born. Tales of swaggies, stockmen, paddle steamers and outlaws filled the pages of newspapers and storybooks and inspired the imagination of a young nation looking for its own unique identity. These days, Burke is a small town struggling to cope with ongoing droughts and the economy relies more on tourism than wool. The Backer Burke Exhibition Centre is a great stopover for the curious traveller. They've set up excellent displays and interactive experiences, but Wes and I have been invited to the Stockman's Arena for an Outback show. Oh, good morning, everyone. Paul Clarkson is the real McCoy. He was working as a horse trainer and stockman before turning his talents to the entertainment industry. A tip here, folks, Paul likes to get people out of the audience to participate in super embarrassing stunts. If that sort of thing terrifies you, hide up the back or go with someone who stands out from the crowd. Without a cow, so I'm going to come out and Thanks, Wes. Thank you. It's not often that we get someone so eager to participate. Can you sound like a cow for me? It's pretty good. <laughs> right, our horns up. Maybe rough the ground up a bit like you're a mad cow. <laughs> Mate, if you put that on, you will look like the real deal. I can feel this horse. He's livened up under me already. Righto, Wes, whenever you're ready, you get going, mate. Down again. You puffed yet, mate? All right, pull up there. You did fantastic, mate. Well yeah. done. I might need those for tomorrow. <laughs> Must be the biggest cow I've had all year anyway. Paul also takes people on history tours reminiscent of the old glory days of Cobb and Co. Cobb and Co were harnessing up anything up to 20,000 horses a day here in Australia. 20,000 20, a day. A day. I love this. It's a great way to see the town in comfort and at a nice pace and learn about our unique history. Whoa. This pub here was built in 1876 and Henry Lawson used to frequent here quite often. And he wrote several short poems and stories about the pub and he referred to it as the Shearer's Arms. Henry Lawson's poems and short stories describe a time when Australia's character was being forged by hardship and daily struggles. Doing the Darling River Run is a great way to stay in touch with that authentic Aussie character. Hey, I've been a cow. We've had a horse and carriage ride. Where are we off to next? Mate, we are off to the beautiful Darling Riverside town of Louth. I don't know if you're aware, but it is also home to one of the world's great monuments to love. Oh, tell me more, tell me more. Folks, this is a pretty incredible story and I've never heard another one like it, quite honestly. So Mary Matthews was a lady in town and she passed away pretty prematurely at age 42. She had six children. Now, 17 years, after Mary passed away, her husband Thomas built this wonderful monument. But it's got an amazing story. You see, on one day of the year, on the 9th of August, that beautiful polished granite cross, it shines in one direction. Just one day of the year, it shines a light directly onto the front door of the house that Mary and Thomas shared together. Their house might be long gone, but the love story of those two simple country folk 
is one that will last forever. Louth has a classic outback pub, Shindy's Inn, which is definitely worth visiting. And you can park your van or just camp out the back. Good clean facilities and only a short stagger home after dinner. Next morning, Wes and I continue our run down the Darling River to visit a couple of old sheep stations. But first, there's a classic outback mailbox some of the Louth locals thought we'd like to photograph for our magazine. So Wes, I don't know if you're aware, mate, but um, in these outback stations, so that the cocky knows whether they've actually got mail or not, because, you know, sometimes they're in a bit of a rush, uh, they actually install a flag on their mailbox. And if that flag is lowered, then they know that the mail has come, then they jump out of the car and grab their mail. And uh, here's a pretty good example of one here, mate. So if this guy had, had uh, mail, this is my mate Junksy's property. Mailman turns up and uh, he simply drops the flag down and then Junksy comes along, picks up his mail, then pops the flag back up again. Brilliant. Yes, say no more. <laughs> and so to our next stop, Dunlop Station. This property used to be a million acres. That's twice the size of the ACT. In its heyday, Dunlop ran almost 200,000 sheep and employed a small army of stockmen, shearers and builders. Today, the property is reduced to just 2,200 acres. And if it wasn't for the efforts of Kim Chandler, a teacher's aide from Louth, this magnificent piece of our history would fall into rack and ruin. And Kim, what sort of drove you to actually come out here? Obviously it's very remote. What lights your fire to, to come out to this sort of area? I grew up in kind of similar type of country on a property at Walgoot. So as a young girl, Dad was a wheat farmer. So girls don't inherit wheat farms. This was my family's chance to get back onto a property and have our own working properties. And once you cross the, the Darling, they say it's definitely in your blood, so it's definitely hooked us in. This beautiful old shed was, in fact, the first in the world to convert from hand shears to mechanical blades. It was 1888, and Aussie inventor Frederick York Woolsey was struggling to convince shearers to make the switch. They went on strike and swam across the Darling to wait out a negotiation. Eventually, a compromise was reached and during the swim home, the man in charge of negotiating was drowned. But that wasn't the end of the troubles. Word got down, up and down the river that this shed had converted and a lot of sheds weren't happy campers with the knowledge that this shed had changed. So i do not not sure how they did it, but they blew that barge or paddle steamer straight out of the water. And the, full of wool, and they full of wool. blew it out of the Darling. <laughs> blew it out of the Darling, and there, um, I haven't seen it yet, but there are still apparently remains of that barge or paddle steamer in the banks at Tulano Station. So, Kim, as a day job, you actually work at the school at Louth? Yes, that's one of my jobs. I work pretty much full-time Monday to Friday, doing about five different jobs. We've got four little boys there at the moment, so... Um, ranging from about six to about ten, and they're great. They're just four little local bush boys, so, uh, but yeah. That's fantastic. That's got to be one of Australia's smallest schools, yeah. It is, <laughs> and probably one of the best. Uh, yeah, we have everything there, so it's great. The Chandler family welcome visitors who book in advance. You can set up camp beside the river, then, for a small fee, join Kim's morning tea and guided tours. A short drive down the road takes us to Trilby Station, where I'm catching up with an old mate for a spot of Riverside Radio. So it wouldn't be a trip of mine through the year unless I bump into Pat Callanan and he's kind enough to join me here on the card table beside the river. Pat Callanan, g'day. Oh, mate, g'day. What a uh, incredible studio you've got here, mate. <laughs> Robert the Duck Smith broadcasts his radio show via the 2GB network all over Australia. <laughs> and while we shoot the breeze, take a quick look around the facilities here at Trilby. These guys offer a wide range of farm stay accommodation and activities, from cabins to campsites with canoes, yabby nets, use of the swimming pool, and self-drive mud map tours, all included in the price. We're setting up the T4 and our swags at Crowther's campsite, which comes with a long drop loo with a view and plenty of firewood. 
What an incredible backdrop on the banks of the mighty Darling River. But what do you eat when you're in this iconically Australian destination? Well, I'm gonna knock you up some lamb, Vegemite and black beer stew. And I'm doing it all on a very Aussie caravan. Pretty damn high tech one too. This is the Track Trailer T4 kitchen and caravan. And I will show you a little bit more about that later on. But let's start cooking. This super simple one pot recipe begins by melting butter into oil, then gently browning one diced onion. Next up, we will pop in our garlic. We're looking at probably about three cloves of garlic in this one. Now for the star ingredient, lamb. Good Aussie lamb, obviously. Is there any other? <laughs> now, the trick with the lamb is just to brown it off. We don't actually want to cook it all the way through. Season the meat, then pour in fresh water, crushed tomatoes. And we'll pop in our root vegetables. So we've got some parsnip here some carrot. Add a generous portion of hot white pepper. And now for the fancy bits of this recipe. We've got a bit of black beer here, some nice dark ale. Beautiful. And our secret weapon, good old Aussie Vegemite. We only need about a teaspoon of this stuff because it packs a fair bit of punch as most people know. Stir those ingredients through. Then bring to the boil and reduce to a simmer for around an hour and a half. While that is simmering away, let me show you this fine bit of machinery behind me. One of the first things you notice when you come inside the T4 is the fact that it has these massive full length panoramic windows. Obviously they give you this incredible framed view of the scenery outside and make it feel really super roomy inside. But on top of that, they're pretty smart, these windows. You see, they're fully bonded to the wall, so they help give the whole van some additional structural integrity. In fact, this award-winning Aussie-designed and built off-road hybrid caravan is full of innovations and cutting-edge technology that make track trailer world leaders, such as military-grade suspension, lightweight body, and a touch-sensitive automatic pop-top. And check out this cracking little hidden pantry using space that would otherwise be wasted. And the electronics in the T4 are really quite astounding. It's all powered by the Red Arc Red Vision system and it hooks up to an app. So you can actually do pretty much everything you need to on your caravan from outside if you want to. My favorite feature is the central locking. Check this out. Cool is that? Meanwhile, Wes has built a great fire just in time for our lamb stew. Okay, we are nearly there. Only another 15 minutes or so of cooking to go. We'll just give it a little bit of a stir and pour in a little bit of greenery, some zucchini. And once that is cooked, we can hook in, folks. I like to serve a tasty stew with big chunks of soft white bread. And this one, the true blue Aussie stew, is as tasty as they get. Next morning, we pack up camp, ditch the hitch, and spend a few hours exploring this part of the Darling River backcountry. When you come to Trilby Station, they give you a mud map of the place, and it has over 100 kilometres worth of tracks. There aren't any challenging four-wheel drive tracks as such, but out in the middle of their biggest, flattest paddock is a funny little collection of sand dunes they said we could christen. Oh, this is gorgeous. It is quite the privilege to drive on sand dunes like this. Are you liking this, young Wes? Mate, this is amazing. Feels kind of greedy. We get these all to ourselves, mate. Yeah, there's not even a, a hint of an old track out here. <laughs> like, I'm not going to call it bog, but you look somewhat tractionally challenged there, Matt. <laughs> oh dear, Wes. <laughs> Oops. 
Oopsies. I had a mid kit. <laughs> yeah, no, I think we're, we're you know, I'm, I'm gonna call that Bob. You are well beyond tractionally challenged. <laughs> what I've managed to achieve here is a fine example of high centering. So now, how best to recover? We could use our tread pros to put them under the tyres that have lost the grip. We could also grab a snatch strap and pull the vehicle out. But we thought probably the easiest way to do this is to just simply hook up a winch and just gently pull the vehicle back. I'm a real fan of winching recoveries because there aren't any shock loads on your machinery. But it can be dangerous, so follow the usual safety procedures such as attaching to rated recovery points and placing a dampener over the cable. Wes has got his engine running. It's really important that you have that alternator charging your starter battery because that's where the winch gets its power from. Now I'm gonna jump in my vehicle and I'm gonna do everything I can to try and assist this winch pull. So I'm gonna put my rear differential lock on so that I can try and drive my vehicle out to assist the winch. Okay, so important to have some comms to the other vehicle as well. We'll use UHF. Okay, Wes, um, go, go your hardest, mate. And we are out of trouble. Easy as that, folks. Trilby's mud mat takes us from the dunes past a holding paddock full of feral goats. Now, it's interesting. Feral goats used to be a problem, but because of the drought, they're now a godsend. Farmers are getting around $150 a head, and that buys hay and cotton seed to hand feed their sheep. But we just found a little guy here that's uh, looking a bit distressed. He's been separated from mum, so we'll just try and uh, round him up and get him back with the rest of the flock. Goat meat is extremely popular in Muslim cultures, which is where these guys are headed. So, not just a godsend for farmers, but also for the local economy. Transport, abattoirs, retail and so on. But sadly, at a lot of the farms, particularly closer to the main highways, there's a bit of poaching going on. People are coming in, grabbing these goats because they're not marked or anything, and basically stealing them off people's properties. Not good. Next stop is out to the New Chum Homestead and Sheds. A step back in time like you would not believe. This old house is essentially the 1950s frozen in time. Apparently everything in the house has been left as it was and the occupants simply walked away. Can't wait to check this out. The old homestead was always left set up and ready with food and supplies for whoever in the family needed it. It's just, in the end, no one did. So here it is, ready. They were not kidding. Check this out, the table perfectly set for morning tea. I oh, remember those tablecloths. Oh, no way, over here, this phone is pretty much identical to what we had in Brewarrina when I was growing up. Our phone number was 58. This place is magnificent. Come on through, guys. Check out the bedroom. Terry toweling bed covers. <laughs> if you need to go in the middle of the night, you are sorted. Oh, no way. The Cooper notebook for stock owners shearing tallies and it's actually been used. So if you want to date the age of your sheep by their teeth, you will know how. This is such a treat coming in here. If we were closer to town, closer to the cities, this place probably would have been knocked down and pilfered and whatever, but it has been left as it was back in the 1950s. Next stop down the river is the tiny town of Tilpa. Not much more than a pub and a bridge, really, but what a great pub it is. I'd highly recommend you stop here for lunch. 
today, Bob. gentlemen. Before you head off, sign your name on the walls or wherever you can find a clear spot and donate a gold coin to the Flying Doctors. Immortality and a good cause with a cold one on Jeez, the side. Jeez, that's ice cold. The last leg of our Darling River run takes us through Wilcannia and on to our final stop, Menindee, home of Kinchiga National Park and the famous Menindee Lakes. There are several excellent spots to set up camp here at Menindee Lakes. This is Kopi Hollow Caravan Park. Good clean facilities, beautiful waterfront sites, and the place where Rob Gregory launches his River Lady boat tours. So much bird life. 240 species have been identified here since about 1830. Rob runs guided wildlife and history tours, and as you may know, Menindee is famous as the last town Burke and Will stopped at on their ill-fated journey to the dig tree. I think they're there for about nine weeks or so. It was a bit of a drunken fest, I think. Yeah, right. Yeah. So, Rob, there was a member of the Burke and Will's party that's not really well known, but was a local to this area. Yeah, that's right, Charlie Stone. He was um, an Aboriginal stockman, and uh, he died up at, um, at Bulu, on the Bulu River in Queensland. So there were seven deaths on the expedition, and, and he was one of them. Imagine if he'd survived all the way to the dig tree. He could have stopped Burke and Wills from being poisoned by uncooked Nardu. Then the colony of Victoria could have claimed more of the country, and how different would Australia be then? Having finished the Darling River run, we head north to Birdsville for the best outback party of the year, the Big Red Bash. Folks, if you only ever go to one music festival in your life, make it this one. Over 10,000 campers, caravanners, four-wheel drivers and like-minded Aussies make their way from all over the nation to set up camp and celebrate our culture. We are camped here for a total of four nights and four nights with no electricity whatsoever and Powering up fridges, powering up all sorts of camera equipment is not enough. So we need to resort to our solar power. These actually plug in to our two lithium batteries. So it really is just a case of topping things up, topping up our power supply for probably about three or four hours each day. And that keeps us absolutely powered to perfection. And it is as easy as that. Red Arc solar blankets come in 115, 150 and 190 watts. We have the 150 watt blanket which pumps out 8.7 amps for every hour of full sunshine. That combined with our Revolution lithium batteries allows us to work remotely off grid for weeks at a time. Bit of a sneak peek on what's uh, going on. The Big Red Bash is the brainchild of Greg Donovan, an ex-accountant and lover of Aussie rock who created this outback masterpiece almost by accident. We didn't certainly didn't set out to create an event of 10,000 people in the middle of the desert. Um, you probably have to have rocks in your head to, to think you're going to be able to do that. It's just something that's sort of grown naturally over the years. But what we did is uh, we had a running event out here called the Big Red Run, 250 kilometres through the desert, raising funds for type 1 diabetes. I've got a son who, is, uh, who has type 1, so I wanted to do some fundraising. Dad's feeling a bit worse for wear, but um, yeah, he's strong enough to get through. So. He'll get through it, and I'm just really proud of him. To celebrate the start of that run, we had John Williamson come out and play on the Big Red June. He just released an album called The Big Red, sold a couple hundred tickets to the public and ended up with a crowd of 500. And, uh, um, yeah, that's, so that's, that's sort of how it started. That was 2013. In 2014, Greg doubled its size and ran at a loss. Then in 2015, he used his own personal savings to pay for Jimmy Barnes to headline. I'm Jimmy Barnes, how are you? I'm out at the Big Red Bash. And this time, 3,000 people turned up. It was a turning point. Word got out, and over the next few years, other big name artists jumped on board to play at the Aussie Desert Festival. Paul Kelly, Johnny Farnham, Hoodoo Gurus, Kate Sobrano, Russell Morris, 
Troy Cassadaly, Missy Higgins, Mark Seymour, the list goes on and on. And do you notice something here? They are all Aussie artists. You know, people come out here and they look around and they go, oh, look, wow, this is just such an iconically Australian outback place. We did a poll amongst our, 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 uh, our, our viewers and our patrons and everybody, and, uh, and that came back, 93% said, don't have any overseas artists. The other 7%, probably a few percent said, uh, yeah, you should get one or two, and then the other said, oh, maybe try one and see what happens. But basically, this is Australian, and it, we want it to remain Australian and celebrate celebrate great Australian music. Every day, that great Aussie entertainment runs from morning till bedtime. For three days, 10,000 fans have to be fed, watered, emptied and protected. Dust in eyes, splinters and that sort of stuff, fractured wrists. Can you talk me through some of these logistics that makes this happen? Yeah, the logistics of putting an event like this where we are is, is mind-boggling. Um, as you say, there's nothing here, there's no power, there's no water, there's no communications, there's no sewerage system, you know, there's nothing. You literally are, literally are in the middle of the desert, so we're sort of creating a little pop-up city and, you know, we've got 200 toilets, composting toilets, which we've designed and built ourselves. Uh, you know, we've got a crew of, uh, crew and our contractors of about 100 people working on all aspects of the event. We've probably got, uh, you know, the best part of 15 big trucks, road trains bringing gear in. Then there's the artists. And when music is this good, the energy on stage and in the crowd is electric. Each night, when the main stage falls silent, we retire to our campfires to plan for the next day's events. Now, Wes, you know that we're actually a major sponsor of, of the Big Red Bash. I do. And we have been since its inception. And that means that we've got to be involved in all different parts of the event. And, right. Uh, and uh, one of those major events of the Big Red Bash, um, I don't know if you're aware, but they actually have a, a drag race. I'm reasonably certain I've actually left my moo moo at home. You have. Perhaps, perhaps my hula skirt as well. And I was worried about that. And that's why <laughs> I've had this specially <laughs> tailor-made frock. For you, Wes. I think that's going to fit you, mate. It's got a little bit oh, of width about it. my god. So, uh, <laughs> it's rather gorgeous floral number. So um, it's all yours, mate. You can be our, wow. our representative at the event. I don't know why, but every single time we happen to go on a trip, I seem to get roped into something, <laughs> something that, that I would normally probably not do. Sure. <laughs> it's day three of the Big Red Bash, and Wes, out of the goodness of his generous heart, has agreed to compete in the charity drag race. I really, really don't want to do this. By dressing up and joining a couple of hundred part-time drag queens in a running race, Wes is raising money for the Flying Doctors. Wes, uh, he doesn't quite know that he's got a little bit more of a costume to put on. Oh my. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> uh, look outstanding. <laughs> the look isn't quite complete yet though, mate. I think we need some accessories. No. We don't, we, we don't. Oh boy. <laughs> got some great colour here, mate. Hey, hang Whoa. On a <laughs> hang on. <laughs> Hold up. I won't say that you're a good sort. It's <laughs> just a good sport. <laughs> just looking at this hunk of grace and sensuality, you could be forgiven for thinking Wes is a one-off. But no, check this out. Come on, team Amra. Only in Australia. <laughs> and they're off in what may be Wes's most humiliating experience to date. Not because he had to dress as a very large bearded lady and not because he fell down big red and came almost last, but because he wasn't selected for the fashion parade. And isn't that always the way? Things happen when you least expect it. Feeling very nervous, feeling slightly concerned. <laughs> 
Too many people behind me to watch my bad moves going wrong. And before we go, it's only fair that I too am humiliated for the sake of a good cause. Yes, we did manage to break the Guinness Book of World Records for most people doing the nut bush. And we raised even more money for the flying doctors. Great stuff. But I am the first to admit the only thing fancy about my footwork are my mongrel boots. I've got to say I've absolutely loved this adventure and it hasn't just been that incredible walk back in time that we've taken. It's that special feeling, that uniquely Australian feel that you get travelling the Darling River Run. It is just so iconic. And then to finish it off with a very iconic party in the Big Red Bash at the edge of the Simpson Desert, well, what a great way to cap off an adventure. I hope you too can do it one day. I'm Pat Callanan, and until next time, keep the shiny side up. Stick around next time as we tackle the incredible and remote Hay River track across the Simpson Desert. This adventure is full of amazing tips, bush tucker, and great desert critters, so don't miss it.